Hey guys, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Tim Sheaf. I've been passionate about the human body and movement ever since I was a child. I was a professional parkour athlete throughout my 20s. And for the best part of the last 10 years, I've been going much deeper into the study of biomechanics. Now, one thing I get asked very frequently is my thoughts on functional patterns. And well, I do have plenty of thoughts on it, some good, some not so good. And so I thought I'd just make a video once and for all, and then I can just send people to this video rather than have to reply to every comment and question I get. So in this video, I'm gonna share my story of how I got into functional patterns, my experience with it during about the year long that I did it, up until the point when I got banned. Then I'm gonna share my thoughts on the practice kind of as a whole, the pros that I see and the cons that I see. And at the end, I'm gonna share briefly what has actually helped me to get out of the physical pain that I was after the whole time. Spoiler alert, it wasn't functional patterns. And before I begin, let me just make this caveat to start that this is just my limited perspective as one human who's gone through it, my whole, you know, being emotional, physical being going through it. So I want to remain neutral, but I'm going to carry my own biases into this review. I try my best not to, but it's going to come through anyway. So just be warned about that. Okay, so let's begin with how I got into functional patterns in the first place. So in around 2019, coming to the end of my kind of parkour stint, I had quite a few injuries, some chronic issues that wouldn't heal. I was getting into running at the time as well and just couldn't seem to shake these issues. I was doing a fair bit of yoga on and off around that time. Thought that my issues were because I'm too tight and if I got more flexible that would ease and relax the muscles and then I'd be, you know, injury free and more athletic. Now, yoga never really gave me any long-term benefits. It gave me some short-term feeling of better. Um, and there was other, you know, introspective practice, and I got to know my better, uh, my body better through that process. But in terms of the athletic gains and the recovery from injury, it didn't give me what I was after and what I was expecting. Now, someone pointed me in the direction of functional patterns and to see Naudi's work at this point. So when I heard Naudi talking about uh, the potential issues that too much passive stretching and yoga can cause, as well as some of the issues with lifting heavy weights on, you know, somewhat unnatural long metal narrow round bars. There's certain things that made sense to me about the disconnections in the body, the, the slack when we're lifting heavy weights with unnatural objects can create issues that I couldn't disagree with. I thought it, it had me intrigued anyway. Now I have, you know, different necessarily views at this point, which we can get into in a little bit, but it intrigued me. And I was like, yeah, this guy seems to be speaking some sense. So from that, I went through uh, the 10 week course that they put online. I did every week pretty much religiously as I went. I also hired uh, the most local coach I could find. I think there's about six coaches in the UK at the time. So I hired one in Wolves about an hour away. And once a week, I'd drive an hour to go and train with this guy. Now, those sessions were intense. Like you go in there, you're in just your boxer shorts or, you know, skimpy shorts. And you get in directed around. You're pulling on the machines. You're holding positions. You're constantly getting feedback and cues. Move your ribs, TVA on, took your hips, shoulders, retract, protract your shoulders, all these different cues that you, you're going through. My, by the end of the session, both my body and my brain felt like they'd had a workout like nothing I'd ever done before in terms of training, had that much like kind of precision. And so these kind of these mind muscle connections were starting to be developed through that. I learned a lot about my compensation patterns in my movements. Um, I felt like this guy that was cueing me knew more about my body than I did myself. And it really kind of blew me away. And I was like, really you know taken back by this I thought wow what a cool unique practice this is after each session I'd feel pretty drained for about 24 hours but I felt pretty much I felt a better connection to my body I'm really excited about the potential prospect of this practice to go you know what it could do for my body and the promises of healing all these injuries and issues that I had niggles that I had in my body that I wanted to to heal I thought wow we're really onto something here so I wanted to go deeper so from there you know I'm fully sold on this practice I want to go deeper I'm someone who doesn't do things by halves I you know dive in with both feet I thought how can I go deeper let me sign up to one of their uh, courses in person so I signed up to one in Belgium the human foundations course drove myself to Belgium three-day course enjoyed it so much really enjoyed it. like loads of cool people you're in a room again you're just in pretty much boxer shorts or really short shorts everyone's basically in their underwear but we're just focused on the body you know, directing each other, cueing these positions, starting to understand, you know, what is functional movement, what the body's designed to do, you know, relating things to locomotion. Very matter of factly, um, you're going, you know, you're the student learning what to do, but you're also being the model that's getting 
taught on as you go. So those three days felt like I'd made some progress. I knew I wanted to do more and I felt like I needed to do uh, more sessions than just one a week. There was another coach based in Bristol that I heard was really good. Um, and so I booked a session with him and went over to, I've got some friends in Bristol as well, went to see them, had a session with this coach, went really well. And I thought, okay, I want to go deeper. Let me uh, hire a place to stay for three weeks. And I was going to book a 10 class pass with this guy and do 10 sessions over three weeks and see what progress I could make in those three weeks. So I also at the time was doing a lot of cold water therapy, cold water immersion. I was just coming out of veganism and kind of got swung to the other side and was looking in experimenting with the carnivore diet. And I was also dabbling uh, with microdosing mushrooms and how and what they were doing, you know, in terms of physically when I would practice stuff on them. Now, this is stuff that I've got very different views on right now. This is 2019 or yeah, 2019 at this moment, um, end of 2019. And I was just like gung ho on, right, if I can create this formula of all these healing modalities back then, put them all together and do it all right with functional patterns, we're going to see some rapid progress, right? That was the vision in my head. And so I wanted to document this. I called it the formula. And on my YouTube channel, not this YouTube channel that I mainly use now, it was my old channel, but it's the main channel that I used before. I documented it uh, privately for my community on there. I had a join pay, a join group, and I, I was sharing it on that. I'm a huge believer in experimenting and think that we should all follow our passions and experiment with them and go, I think it's okay to follow our curiosities and go deeply into those things. And then, you know, be honest and share our findings. And about halfway into this, Naudi got wind of what I was doing with the formula and I got a message from my coach saying that he wasn't allowed to train me anymore. He'd got a message from, you know, the higher ups from Naudi, whatever, saying that I wasn't allowed to do the, the sessions. This was like about three or four sessions in. I was devastated. Uh, I was really like, like pretty hurt at the time. I really, I really believed in functional patterns as this silver bullet to my injuries. I just knew I just needed, you know, more and more of it. I was, I was desperate. I was really desperate to fix it. Uh, I really wanted to just play with my body again. I wanted to feel that feeling like when you're a teenager and even, you know, early twenties when you just had the freedom of your body and you could pretty much, you know, abuse it as you wanted and it would just put up with it. And you get to your late twenties, early thirties. And of course it no longer plays ball like that. And there's, these are all lessons for other reasons that, you know, I'm grateful for now, but at the time I was just like, you know, functional patterns going to use this thing it's going to fix me and then I can go back to doing all the things that I love that make me happy in this quite addictive, desperate manner, to be honest. Um, but anyway, message with Naudi one on one that night and we had a back and forth. Um, I won't go into the specifics of the messages. He did offer me some personal truth about myself, some stuff about entitlement and things which on reflection and even, at, you know, at the time I was like, there is there's some truth to this stuff. Um, but there's also um, quite a lot of off base remarks that felt pretty abusive. Um, yeah, quite emotionally abusive stuff. But yeah, I don't want to make this video about that. That's what, when I'm saying that, you know, this is going to be biased. I've obviously got some feelings with that, that I've, that I've, I think I feel better about it now, which is why it's easy for me to make the video now, but I was definitely quite hurt at the time. Um, and this was also around the time I, uh, like I said before, I'd stopped being vegan and there was a lot of videos of vegans making videos attacking my character on YouTube uh, done in quite cruel ways. Um, and I think basically my take on it at the time, I don't know this, this was what I felt like. He'd watched some videos of other people talking about Tim Sheaf on YouTube and just gotten this idea of me through them. Uh, and I don't feel like it was the, he really, you know, got to know me or my intentions. But at the same time, I will say, maybe the fact that I'm not someone who, you know, if I see something that I disagree with, I'll try and speak up about it. If I change my opinion on something for the moment, you know, I'm still human, but I, st I still think I'm someone who, I believe that's the mark of character, right? Is you can admit when you were wrong about something, change your opinion and then be honest. And then if you, even if you're wrong about it again, you can continue to, to admit these mistakes that we make. And that's, that's character of a human. So, I did that with veganism and I could see why potentially he saw that as a threat to uh, functional patterns that if I'm someone who at the moment I disagree, I will either speak out against 
the person I disagree with or I'll, I'll speak publicly and say, you know what, this isn't the thing that it was promised to be. You know, somewhat like I did with veganism, he maybe sensed that that could happen with functional patterns and I might not play ball the way he wants a lot of his students to do so. But ultimately, um, it's his it's his system, it's his, whatever he's built, culture, whatever it is, it's his thing that he's built and he has a right to do that. And if he doesn't want to allow me into it for whatever his reasons are, I don't know what they were or are, that's fine. That's, that's, it is his call. How he spoke to me, I guess is not fine. Again, that's my issues to deal with. It's his right to treat me as he wants to, is how I respond to that, is on me. But ultimately it wasn't resolved and I was banned. And I remember praying that night, as I say, I was very desperate. I was, oh, you don't have to be desperate to pray, of course. But I was praying that night. And shortly after that I, is when I discovered David Weck's work and the Weck method. And that has led me down a whole beautiful, you know, it kind of moved me from one area to another. And it's been a beautiful journey since then. Um, but that's a whole other story. So that was my journey in and kind of out of FP, just so you know how I got here. It was, you know, maybe nine months, something like that. Um, full journey within that within that 2019 and um, now since then it's, you know it's five years past they banned me on most of their social medias but I do occasionally see videos you know some things sit through people send me stuff stuff pops up and in that time my own understanding of biomechanics has developed I've every day spent with my body you know, learning, learning things just through the process of being with it and practicing different things. I've done so many different systems since that. Um, to go to knees over toes guy, flowability, WEC method, you know, Pilates, yoga, other stuff. I've gone back and immersed myself in Alexandra technique, Feldenkrais, bioenergetics. You know, I've, I've dabbled in a lot of different things in that time, and so I thought I'd, as I mentioned, make. A sort of list of pros and cons to what my current perspective on functional patterns is as I see it and as I say I'm not deeply in the system I'm not spent any time with Naudi personally so I don't fully know his vision on it but this is my take on it as an outsider who's dabbled in it basically so take it as you want take it with a pinch of salt however you feel so some pros I see with functional patterns so some pros I see with functional patterns that I feel that they get right. So number one, I want to say uh, precision. There is a big focus on precision. As I mentioned, you're, you're there in your skivvies, just in your boxer shorts, minimal clothing, so we can see what's actually going on in the body. And it's very personal to that one. It's one-on-one -on -one with the person. Um, I think this is great. It helps you know your body. I think you can't just put these cookie cutter sets and reps especially when you're trying to get out of pain I think if you've got a fully kind of functioning body without pain injuries niggles you can do sets and reps and you can follow someone's strength program with sets and reps and you will probably get the prescribed results but if you have issues injuries instabilities you need stuff to be precise for your body and so I think they really get this right and as well as that and intertwined with that is the mind muscle connection that gets developed because you're getting these very precise cues in that session with that coach I think that's a great f uh, way to learn your body and to develop you know muscular proficiency within the body and body control as you get older 30s 40s 50s 60s this is the stuff I think we miss in our younger years and our teen years that physical education doesn't teach us is mind muscle connection is body control that some people get through practices like dance but most sports don't really teach us it we just it's just a crab shoot some athletes make it through they naturally have better muscle control but it's not something we are taught or developed at school and I think we probably should be have done and yeah since I've got into things like Maxic who's an old school bodybuilder but I did a months and months of his stuff that was really profound and it made me appreciate that when functional patterns do this stuff there is a lot of mind muscle connection getting developed pro number two is that they relate to locomotion and I think this is very much overlooked in most elsewhere in the fitness and gyms kind of space is the primary function of the physical body we could say one of the primary functions is locomotion is walking and running and most of the time when we go to the gym our training is done bilaterally which is two sides at the same time pull-ups squats deadlifts bench whatever we're doing a lot of training is done 
Whereas when we're walking, we're walking, they call it contralateral, one side at a time working with the opposite. Up, so the, the right leg works with the kind of left shoulder and the left leg works with the right shoulder. Simplification, but there's this kind of like cross body action going off. Call this contralateral motion, relates to locomotion. A lot of their training is focused contralaterally to relate to locomotion. And I think that is, like I said, overlooked in most other systems. And because of this, they focus on a lot of rotational movement the hips, the hips and the ribs learning to rotate these and control them separately. Whereas often the hips and the ribs are just glued. Like this is one big square block and, and, and then the arms and legs are just appendages that we move. Whereas we can actually rotate from these and create separation and activate the spine and all the, the core muscles that help to make this movement happen. That's something that I think they focus on, which I think is great. Third point that I really like with their system is that a lot of the stuff they do is very slow and controlled and somewhat isometrically kind of holding positions or working slowly through positions and since getting into someone like you know I interviewed on this channel Dr. Doug McGuff his approach with body by science I really like this slow and controlled method because you can't skip over any weak links you can't use momentum to skip past anything so when we do this and we're precise about this we can find those weak spots and work through them kneading through them or hang out in them isometrically and I think this really helps to kind of weld or cement in a lot of the instabilities and cracks within our bodies, which helps us to feel and function better. I talk a lot on this channel about, I'm not all about reps and sets. I like, especially when we're trying to get out of pain or build stability in the body or build a body that we can move without inhibition. We want to just get to a position that needs work, cook in that position and then come out of it. And that's what I think they do well at functional patterns. Number four, personal biomechanical truth so this is something that helped me a lot was recognizing my compensation patterns as they call them um dysfunctions is another word they use i didn't know much about this in myself until i got into functional patterns now i don't think you need functional patterns to learn this stuff but it helped me and it was a part of my journey and then when i got into things like go and stuff as well that helped develop it and then to a point when i can do, do this and understand this on my own without any systems or guidance, but it helped like land me into this. Now, the human body has, I see it like an optimum way that it was designed to function, you know, using kind of glutes and the back chain to drive us forwards. A lot of the front stuff is more about stability and control. A bit of a simplification, we can do more than that, but, if, but there are backup systems, I believe, maybe God built them into the body so we can use our quads to move more than our glutes and our glutes cannot be engaged or recruited and we can still move but to be an optimum and a high level athlete or move with the proficiency that we have the potential to move with we need to get back to the using the body with the, the the way it was ultimately designed to use that we've kind of lost or never developed within ourselves and so when you're in there with a coach you're getting this you know biomechanical truth about yourself about your dysfunctions and your compensation patterns, that is valuable information that you can go, oh yeah, I do do that. Oh yeah, why am I recruiting that muscle along with that muscle? That one can be relaxed so that I you can use this properly rather than work against myself. Or There's value in learning the truth about ourselves, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, whatever it is. And so this is, I think, something that they do well in that space is you get truth. Fifth thing I like uh, in the system that I think they focus on is a lot of transverse abdominus um, cueing and activation is a huge part of what they do. And that's the corset around the, the belly here, not the, the six pack, the rectus abdominis, but behind that, that kind of helps keep us dialed in and anchored in. So when our limbs are out here doing whatever we're doing with our legs and running and stuff, we have that central kind of pin, we're cogged, grounded into that center point. And so there's not, I don't, don't want really to get too deep into the biomechanics of it now, but they have a big focus on this. And ironically, I don't, I don't even, I'm sure Naudi must know this, but this is a yogic thing. The Uddiyana Banda is recruiting, you're, is turning your TVA on, is this corset in Pilates, they talk about it, zip up from your belly button, you know, to your chest. This corset support stabilizer action is the transverse abdominus. Flowability have a huge focus on TVA as well. And I think this is something that, you even look at the old school bodybuilding stuff, the Maxic program, 
and they do it now in the modern stuff, but it comes from the old stuff. There's a lot of focus on this kind of um, intra-abdominal pressure, creating pressure, pulling inwards. Now, this is something I'm, I've not gone hugely deep deep into. I'm nowhere near like an expert in this kind of field. And I've, like I say, not gone deep into it. But it's something that I see in functional patterns. I see it in yoga, Pilates, old school bodybuilding. I think there must be something to it. And I've explored and experimented with it. I've got to go further into it. But they do it. It ticks a lot of boxes for me. Felt right when I was doing it. Other people, there's a lot of other systems use it as well. I think that's something they get spot on. Sixth and final point here is that a lot of the points Naudi's make makes about passive stretching can be damaging for the body. Um, and some of the stuff about weightlifting, I do generally tend to agree. Now, that's a bit of a blanket statement. I don't entirely agree. I think if passive stretching feels good, that it's a very personal thing, right? If it feels good, it could be good. That's not black and white like that, but I think a lot of passive stretching can be either switching off and disconnecting from the body, and we're just holding a position for X amount of time, and we're like disconnecting. But I much prefer stretching when I'm actively recruiting or pulling or, you know, engaging muscle. And I think the true root of yoga is a lot more muscular activation and connection than we think. I think in the West, we look at yoga as this stretching practice where you just bend as far as you can with all the muscles kind of switched off. Whereas I think originally there's a lot more engagement and recruitment in the body that is lost. So I think he's right about the Western approach to yoga, but I don't necessarily think he's right about the traditional roots of yoga. Same with weightlifting. I think something like lifting a sandbag where your whole upper body is involved, it's a more natural, big weighted object than a barbell where you know, you're know you holding this skinny bar with a massive amount of weight on it in your hands. It, it just, there's something almost unnatural that doesn't relate to anything else in nature when we lift it that we can put in a heinous amount of weight that if we're not fully connected or integrated or we don't uh, have sensitivity in our body to create tensions throughout the system which a lot of people don't then you could it's dangerous to lift heavy weights now some people naturally have got that connection or if you you know if you lift strongman type lifting and then go to like barbell lifting that might help because you look at someone like eddie hall who was able to get the deadlift record came from strongman so i think there's something there is something to be said for strength training done the right way but i think for a lot of people everyday folk go to the gym start lifting heavy weights on a barbell i agree that there are risks uh, um with doing it that way that naudi talks about big point i want to make one of the biggest points i make in this video is about that is that yes i agree with what he has identified for the most part about yoga and weightlifting but just because someone has identified a problem correctly or close to correctly, it doesn't mean that the solution that they are then offering is also correct. And this is true of so much, it's probably true in every industry, but I see it in the fitness industry and especially in this kind of fringe biomechanical fitness industry so much. People identifying problems correctly, so therefore my solution is correct and you should follow my solution. And it's so hard when you especially when you're new in that space not to just believe that and after a few you know times of hearing stuff and agreeing with that and then going down you learn okay just because they're saying that you know but i think this is a big point that gets overlooked especially by people new in this space is they'll hear someone speak with conviction about something that is incorrect they'll agree with it so therefore they buy into the system and that's just not the case that just doesn't that's not how it works and yeah i don't think they're intentionally being manipulative i think unknowingly they just think they're right um, so they're going to speak like that. But I think for those that are buying into it, they don't realize this. So I just say that's something to look out for. So on that note, then, as we're going into the more negative kind of things, let's talk about the cons that I see that I kind of disagree with uh, functional patterns approach. So number one is it's almost purely uh, locomotion focused. And I guess it's called functional patterns. So it's running and then things like throwing as well. I think they focus almost too much on this and there's no no real scope for self-expression or something like you think of something like dance and the amount of ranges and positions that a dancer is going to get to or you know even look at a break dancer a ballet dancer i don't know jazz dancer or i don't know all sorts of dancing and self-expression that people will do they're going to get into all sorts of ranges that won't fit into what people may see as a functional pattern and i think 
to have a healthy, well-rounded physical body and physical practice, you want both ends of that spectrum. You want, you know, the strict, I'm able to sprint and I understand how to sprint and use my body in that way. But then I also know how to let go of that and be free and kind of loose and expressive too. And I think they're so, they focus low solely on one. And, you know, that's their choice and their right to do so. Um, but I, I like to explore both ends. Number two, I think they focus so much on dysfunction and this can kind of send you on a, a bit of a downward spiral where all you see is dysfunction and compensation patterns and so you get this sort of self-critical not everyone but some people have more of an affinity towards it and I think I did as well this kind of self-critical self-judgment oh my feet I walk duck-footed and that's a problem so I'm going to have ankle issues and you know lo and behold I have ankle issues I'm not saying it came from my mind but it is connected and there is a spiral so much focus on dysfunction can do and I think people what matters more is if people are in pain than if their body looks like it's dysfunctional or looks like it's using compensation patterns if the person's feels okay and they're doing what they want to do I think that's fine but too much focus on there's one set way to do this and if you're not doing it it's dysfunctional and therefore you need to correct it I, I don't know there's just yeah you can just go too deeply down that spiral like I say number three this is uh the main one that I think that they overlook in terms of actually having a functioning fully uh, a functional body and what for me I deem as functional patterns is a lot of their stuff they they focus heavily on rotation which is great most people miss that but I don't it's not majorly 3d um how do I put this there's not much vertical work compared to someone like when I got into David Weck's work with the coiling core where the shoulder comes down and the hip comes up and this side this side becomes shorter and this side becomes longer we do some of this landmine work you know moving on the infinity pattern of motion which encourages as wet calls it the verticalization of the shoulders there's not loads of vertical i see some in some of the slow maneuvers there is some you know rib cueing and angles like that but not to the depth that i think david weck has teaches and that I agree with on Weck's approach to this so a lot of them look quite flat-footed and they're doing rotational work with the pulleys which is like I say good for strengthening certain things but it doesn't look very like up and downy there's not much horizontal uh, vertical shift going off in that kind of position now again I'm not deep into not super deep into the system this is just when I see some of them moving online and doing the way they train and this is only gonna be one you know snippet of their training it just looks quite flat-footed compared to I think for a like well-rounded athletic system there should be some type of like balance stability work and I have seen Naudi play on Swiss balls before I don't know I don't think he really teaches it like I, I like I do like I think there's huge value in getting someone to learn to balance on a Swiss ball I don't see them use it as part of their system they see it as more of a gimmick maybe but things like that I think are great for someone to help develop you know spatial awareness and, and relationship to their own proprioception and ability to balance and things like plyometric drills I've never really seen them do any plyometric work kind of explosive stuff they'll do stuff with maybe kettlebells and some moving around stuff which I think is pretty cool I like the way they use kettlebells more than most traditional stuff which is very bilateral and rigid and square they put more angles and stuff into it which I I think that's like I say I think that's pretty cool I just still think there's a lot of flatness and not much pulsing and bouncing and you know things like skipping and uh, tendon strengthening work and putting martial intent like parkour is so overlooked by the biomechanical fitness space not not you know I can't say everyone overlooks it but I think it is a huge expression of functionality and a development tool of functionality because you're putting every cell and fiber of your being into an action it's like there's, as wet calls it martial intent which most people think of with fighting where you you know trying to do use all your energy to go through someone or whatever when you apply that to environment physically and you're jumping and moving through it I'd like to see them well, I don't know they can do what they want <laughs> I think that's a valuable part of a full well-rounded functional practice is some sort of getting through your environment with martial intent and I don't think they do that other than other than sprinting they do do it with sprinting Point number four, um, they, I mean, they don't, not no acknowledgement of other systems. They don't have to acknowledge other systems, but I don't agree that, uh, that they, that Naudi has everything in one system and there's nothing in any other system that there isn't value in. 
Now, maybe he has credited stuff. And I'm sure he's he'll credit in his way, maybe, but not in any kind of substantial way. Like, for me, rope flow is an absolute, like, a pillar of a biomechanical practice that any other biomechanist that hasn't, that has tried rope flow and doesn't credit it as what it can do for the body, even people like Gota, I see them use rope flow because of putting this infinity pattern through the spine and this, you know, shifting the head over foot, which I know now he agrees with Weck on the head over foot in locomotion. I've heard them on a phone call together when they'd agreed whether he'll admit it publicly or not is a different issue. But I know he acknowledges that Weck has got learned some biomechanical stuff, however he discovered it, that he agrees with. But then there's no public acknowledgement for whatever fear he has of making him look like he doesn't have all the answers and he's not the sole you know leader in this space yeah very rarely see well i don't follow it much but <laughs> giving credit to someone else yeah i just think that's there's a huge amount of arrogance there speaking to someone who's arrogant myself you know kettle calling the pot black but when there's, I know there's, I know one thing. There's when there's arrogance, there's often equal parallel blind spots. You know, right behind that arrogance, we stick our neck out this way. This is the thing, and there's all these blind spots over here. So, yeah, I think you miss out when you're one system and you're saying no other system has anything. We have the whole thing figured out ourselves, which is pretty much what he said to me. Is that what I'd, you know? That's then you. I think you're missing something. Next point, I think. Again, it's absolute, this is all their right to do it the way they want to do it. But it feels very uh, serious and sterile without, there's no room for games or fun or play. And I strongly believe, I believe in a God and I believe God made a opportunity for a loving system here on earth and that a loving system of physical education and development of biomechanics, play is a, a major aspect of that, you know, as kids and teenagers it should be at least 50 percent, if not more of the aspect of developing this stuff and i don't see any real room for games or play within that system that I've, from my experience with it very serious um and i understand you know people are suffering and i understand how it can get serious and i'm someone who's also very serious but i also acknowledge that if we don't make room for games or play then i think we're missing out on a part of the point of having a physical body second to last point is like i don't want to make this an attack but it is very cool like it's very cool like um i was a member of the facebook group and anytime nadu would make a post there would be over 100 comments all saying understood full stop understood full stop and it was just quite worrying there was just no room for anyone to have personality in that space other than him as the voice of reason and anyone else that disagrees, you know, gets banned, kicked out. And it's just a huge, you're either with us or against us kind of energy. And it just felt quite kind of worrying to see a lot of these young, mostly men looking up in, into this way, giving up, giving up all their own mind and ideas to this one man to, to kind of lead them to the promised land. Uh, yeah. We'll leave that there for that point. I don't want to, you know, people, people that, see it from the outside can have their own perspectives on that final point that i guess is a con but is a con in most systems is the the lack of acknowledgement of emotional work that needs to be done uh, my journey of biomechanics has led me to see that emotional work and introspection is possibly the most important of all the work that can be done i've sort of seen him acknowledge in some way that that's got value uh, but not not in the way that I think it really like has to have value for real lasting change because we focus so much on the physical and we miss the spiritual as though it's something ethereal or made up or make believe and it's very spiritual laws are incredibly real and factual and and effectual as strong as gravity or anything else spiritual laws are at play it just takes uh, sensitivity and observation through life to start to acknowledge this and within the spiritual laws is emotional work. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, very shortly on. Yeah, ultimately, I just think there's way more emphasis needs to be put on emotional work alongside the biomechanics stuff to make lasting change. So as you can see, I do see some value 
in functional patterns approach to biomechanics. I personally am grateful for it as a step in my journey. It was a big part of my introduction to biomechanics. And I do see and agree with a lot of the points that Naudi makes. I disagree with some other points and I disagree massively, uh, mainly with the way that he approaches sharing it. Now, I know large portions of the fitness industry and space think Naudi is a charlatan. Now, I don't think that, I don't agree with that. I think Naudi has got value. I think he's alienated himself massively and without being open to acknowledging and crediting other people, he I don't think he'll ever get the acknowledgement that he feels he deserves. And I think that's a, that's quite sad for him. I think as he continues to explore and grow, he's I think he is going to soften over time. And as he softens, you know, you look at someone like Paul Check back in the day and a lot of these, the older fitness guys have softened over time. I think now he will soften and maybe then, you know, there can be more of a bridging of the gap between his system and other systems in this space. But for now, I think he's, yeah, he's alienated himself. Now, would I recommend functional patterns? I'll say this. If you want to try it, I'd say put your money towards hiring a one-on-one -on -one in-person coach if that's possible for you rather than doing the 10-week online course. I don't, I don't think the 10-week course online is is it's not worth the money, that's for sure, I'd say that. If you can put your money towards a, a practitioner in person, you're supporting the person and you'll get more from that one-on-one -on -one experience. The main thing I'll say though is this because it is very much a personal decision. Um, I don't think most people need it at all. I don't think, you know, but... I would encourage you to follow your curiosity with it. If you're curious about something, go into it. It's led me to, through functional patterns, whack method, knees over toes, go to flowability, you know, all these things. I've got into them and I've experienced stuff in each of them that's been different from the others, but it's helped me to know my own body, body better. And from that, I was able to create the school of biomechanics where I share what I feel is the most valuable stuff that I've learned about biomechanics on my journey. And actually, the most valuable stuff I've learned about my own mechanics has hadn't, hasn't come from any of those systems. And it came from spending time with my own body uh, and discovering something I call the feather barrier mechanism. I didn't create it. I just I, I honed in on it. Other people have got different names for it, maybe. But I've not heard anyone give it as much focus. I think that is the main focus when getting out of um, pain, the main physical focus, because there's emotional stuff, like I say, needs to be done as well. But the main physical focus is my understanding, discovering and understanding of the feather barrier mechanism. Then you don't need a coach. You don't need anyone's system. You just need your own body and your own sensitivity to it and time, presence and focus. And then you can work through a lot of the issues. Learning that, just give, stopping doing other systems for a few years and, and coming to that and going, there's something here and actually starting to go all in on that is what has finally allowed me to train and move and express myself which five years ago, I couldn't dream about. Like I'm doing parkour again, I'm able to sprint. That is what has changed me physically and allowed me the space and enabled the growth and development that I was seeking all those years ago when I started with FP. I got there without it, just with my own self, my space, my body, perhaps some help from God, who knows. So I won't go into that in loads of details now. That is what the rest of my channel is for, so I share that in other videos on my channel. And I also teach it within the School of Biomechanics as a part of what I teach, which I'll link down below if you want to check that out. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. I want to make one final major uh, point and takeaway from my journey of biomechanics to share with you to end this video. And that is that the journey of biomechanics has led me more strongly to see the truth of what I would call soul mechanics. Just like spiritual spiritual supersedes the physical soul mechanics supersedes biomechanics so what do i mean by that because i know for most people that probably sounds like ethereal wayward thinking idealistic hippie language all i mean by that is that each of us carry emotional baggage with us repressed feelings from our day-to-day -day lives from jobs we don't like from relationships we're struggling with from our childhood, which I think is a greater factor than any of us actually really realize at this point, these repressed feelings manifest as biomechanical issues in within our physical bodies. As an example of that, just imagine how something like the feeling of insecurity or lack of self-worth affects someone's posture. 
if we feel insecure or not worthy, we might shrink ourselves to not fill the environment. Our shoulders round forward, we hunch up, our legs come in, holding and creating tensions in the body that are lasting. Now, the root of this, you know, most people these days probably following the mainstream science would say, you know, it's in the mind. They say it's in the heart. I feel the soul is a more accurate place. It's not in the physical space. It's stored somewhere beyond us, but it's a very real thing that's affecting us in the physical right now. Imagine someone's, you know, has stress, their hair's falling out or the digestion's not as good when we're stressed. You know, you quit that job and you suddenly feel relaxed and relieved. It changes your posture. Very real physical reactions to emotional causes going off. And so without an acknowledgement of that, that that is superseding this, we can do all the physical work we want, but it's kind of like trying to put toothpaste back in the toothpaste tube, because if we're not, you know, changing the opening to, to get it in, in a more, I don't know, a better analogy, you can do it all you want, you can paint a turd gold, it's still a turd, right? If we do all the physical work and fighting and cranking that we want to do, but we don't deal with the emotional root, it's not really going to make any lasting change. On that example, I want to give the opposite of that because someone might feel insecure and then they've learnt that they have to puff their chest out to combat that feeling. So, you know, to counter this inner feeling of insecure, they change their posture in the opposite way, which is a facade covering up the insecurity and then they create physical issues. You might get scapular problems or something because you're, you're forcing yourself to pin your shoulders back. You don't actually, comp like internally, you don't actually feel confident it's just something you've trained yourself to hold yourself towards as a front so that you don't, you know, you learn it in childhood so that your environment doesn't attack you or for whatever reasons it's come about. But these, what's going on in our inner world affects our physical world and it can have, pol appear to be polar opposite effects, but with the same route, just one step removed. Ultimately though, what I'm trying to say is that without introspection and emotional work paired with the biomechanical work, it's hard to make any lasting change. And this is the area that I think me, we, well, we all need it. I need it. Naudi needs it. David Weck, Ido Portal, the go-to guys. So many of the men in this like fringe fitness space, in the broader fitness space, in the manosphere, in the world. This is an area we all <laughs> need, need work in. And I'm laughing probably because of my own, you know, avoidance of it because I've, you know, it's easy for me to talk about it and not do it. Maybe I only want to talk about it because it helps me avoid actually doing it myself. But I just can recognize and acknowledge that we all need this work. And this work, especially as people that are the pioneers or, or in this space teaching to others, it's going to affect how loving we treat those others that maybe look up to us. When I say love, I don't mean just this fake, nice, happy, you know, tell sweet people sweet nothings about themselves. There's absolutely space for direct honesty to be shared with each other if we all want to grow and there absolutely needs to be but it has to be done with some level of compassion and loving intention for it to make any substantial difference and I think this is where a lot of this fitness space falls short is many of the men here believe they have we have the answers and we want to tell each other so vehemently that we are right and why they need to listen to us but the motivations for it most of, in most of us isn't actually here to help other people it's because we want to be seen as the one that is right that has the answers that saved humanity in some messianic way whatever it is rather than this genuine desire of actually compassion and wanting to help people and that's you know there's a reason I've attracted myself into this sphere because I've got so much work to do there just something I wanted to reflect to help other people is that's this is what's going to turn many people away. Those people who are sensitive to those motivations, whether it's conscious or unconsciously, they're aware of that. Many people are going to avoid listening to people like Naudi and David Weck and Edo and then because of these blocks that we project out into the world. Then the, the people that are attracted to them and why I was probably attracted to Naudi and other me young men in this space is codependent, emotional issues where we maybe didn't have a, a father figure who taught us how to be an actual man in a true God's view of what a man is, not just maybe the mainstream's view of what a man is. And that's what I see a lot 
in this space and in the manosphere is a lot of boys looking for a male role model through their own injured perspective of what they think a male role model should be like and really we're just looking up to other men who are more emotionally injured than ourselves and in my case I'm probably one of the men that's more injured than most of the other people that maybe look up to me we're all still boys ourselves we, none of us are really we're just playing this game of internet with each other and it's just <laughs> we're just not really we're just all still little kids playing in the playground and there's not really any men in this space and when there are men most of us in don't recognize it because they may be gentler or soft some more softer spoken than what we're used to hearing or what we want to hear so those are my final thoughts on the matter hopefully there's some sense within the rambling and you got something from it thank you for watching and maybe i'll see you in the next video godspeed